Here we are back in the studio with uh, Eric Jensen of Sotoria Gallo. Uh, we just finished the bespoke fitting uh, of my second piece from Eric, a beautiful tweed uh, with a cavalry twill uh, set of trousers. Eric, thank you so much. Good now to see that you, Kirby. Yes. I guess technically by the time this is going, the, that video has been published. So it's now yes. time for us to drink to the comments. Amen to that. Uh, to the comments. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Um, <laughs> so hopefully they were easy on you, but uh, you know we've got it's high scrutiny here. It's on the Kirby it Allison is it channel. is you you cultivate a uh, good crowd of very astute watchers. If yeah, I, if I there will. we go. So yeah. <laughs> uh, um, we should um, we should guess. You know what do we yeah. think the comments were? I mean, surely they were. I mean, you they're going to comment on, on the suit, your, on the, your suit and yes, the shoulders, and the shoulders and the color. But you're an Italian tailor, so you get a certain degree of uh, of a pass of, of yeah. a pass on you know just being as a as they would say with Nick Falks, far out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and the the, diff, the problem is, is that my fair skin kind of gives me away. So it's kind of like... As Italian? Yeah, as yeah, Italian. Yeah, you know? yeah, there you go. Like I'll be in Rome and I'll, you know, be ordering, you know, and talking to a waiter and they'll keep giving me these looks like, are you Italian? Is your Italian that good that they like, they can't place you? So last time I went, it, ha it happened that way. Where it was like... That's amazing. Yeah, they, uh... they didn't know. What a accomplishment. Well, yeah. yeah, I was quite proud of myself. And then yeah. I told Rachel, I was like, anytime a waiter gets anywhere near us, like we've got to speak Italian. only speak Italian. Yeah. And she was like, okay. And then uh, one time they caught us speaking English. And I was like, <laughs> uh, well, we're enjoying a Hori de Monterey short. Uh, we don't have as uh, much time as we would like, but enough to sit and chat. I'm using my new, this is my SD DuPont. We just started carrying lighters on the website. Uh, ST DuPont, and so oh, this is a um, gold dust. Well, no. All right. Can I see it? it? Yeah. Um, oh, that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So I got that uh, as a treat to myself in time for Cuba. So that was How my, was Cuba? Uh, Cuba was amazing. I mean, obviously. Um, I mean, it was uh, just an absolutely extraordinary amount of work. I think we were there for 12 days. I filmed for 10 of the 12, uh, which uh, basically means that the with we filmed every day with the exception of the day we flew in and the day I flew out. No way. Which is, um, that, that's I'm, a lot I'm of starting work. to question my sanity in terms of my work <laughs> ethic. It may be a little bit too much. Well, I think, uh, I think everyone out there appreciates it. Yeah. You know. But it was my first time to Cuba. I mean, literally a trip that I'd been waiting my life for. Um, and it was a bucket list trip something I really was looking forward to. And so it was like a kid in the candy shop. You couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. Yeah. I wanted to film everything. <laughs> um, you get to see like all the different, uh, you know, the rolling process, the growing, I would imagine everything. Yeah. I mean, we saw almost everything. Yeah. Right. You can't see it all just because, you know, different things happen like at different seasons. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see any of the curing or any of the planting, uh, but it was a great trip. I really look forward to publishing that content. Uh, I can say that you know we were given what I think will end up being some of the most significant and extensive access that anyone's really ever been given in Cuba to film. That's amazing. Um, so that's a privilege and an honor and something yeah. I'm excited about. I mean, that, that, that has some panache with it. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right? Uh, and it totally whet my appetite for um, going back and doing more content just because there's so many incredible stories to tell there. That's incredible. I think, I think everyone will enjoy it. I feel like cigars and tailoring and food and wine and all those things kind of all go hand in hand. And I think a lot of people want to know, nowadays especially, I think people really want to know what what hands are going into what they're consuming. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And, uh, yeah. It goes back to the idea of having someone make something for you. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, and with Cuban tobacco, there's an incredible amount of handwork. I mean, I think that it is the most widely enjoyed handmade product in the world, certainly the most accessible. Yeah. Um, I mean, even with as expensive as Cuban cigars have become, you know, compared to a bespoke suit or a bespoke pair of shoes or anything else that's made completely by hand, yeah. um, you see more accessibility in Cuban tobacco than really anything else. I will agree. And just a shameless plug. So we were in PT yeah. uh, this last time in January. You got and a lot of photographs taken, I saw. Yes, we you did. And Rachel, not, yeah. not by virtue of you. More no, of more life. from her. But she was wearing our stuff, so it's fine. It's like I was there. But anyways, we were there. You're amused, except I was, she's yeah, your wife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it works that way, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, I guess oh. so, yeah. So anyways, while we were there, I was like, well, I want to get some cigars. 
so I popped into some shop in some piazza. I don't ask me where, but if you guys want to know, email me. I'll try to tell you where this is. Went to a cigar store, told the guy I wanted some cigars. He said, you know, like, what kinds do you like? I said, well, usually I like smoother cigars, and I don't want anything too long of a smoke because mm-hmm. I'm not going to be, like, have too yeah. long to smoke. So he pulled out, like, three or four. And I was like, all right, I'll take them. And I was like, what type are they? And he's like, oh, cu- Cubano. They're Cubans. I was like, oh, man, this is going to cost me. Yeah. It ended up being 20 euro. Really? Yeah. 20 euro, four cigars. Might be, maybe I was in Florence and I was enjoying my time there or something, but they're probably some of the best smokes I have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where you are and uh, with whom you exactly. are uh, really matters so yeah. much. I, I had a guy who sells uh, cigars tell me that that's offensive to him when people say that. Hmm. Because... You know, because he put so much, they put so much effort into the yeah. tobacco and the rolling and everything. Well, it's not to diminish that. Yeah, I know. You know it yeah. only heightens it. <laughs> it does. Yeah. But I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Mm-hmm. I think like some of my favorite moments or my favorite cigars were because of who I was with and what I was doing and, you know, yeah. things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's like it's, having the opportunity to go to Rome and, you know, go to a bespoke tailor. Or yeah. To get a good friend. Get a good friend. You know, to be... You know, make garments for you. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the beauty of Bespoke as well, is that, like, we've lost that a lot Mm -hmm. now. And especially going through the pandemic and everyone being shut down and locked in their houses and there was no real social contact with Mm -hmm. anybody. Now to have a place where you can go, sit down, have a drink, talk to the guy who's making your clothes, go through the fitting process with him. That that in and of itself is worth worth a hefty fee. When a cigar really slows things down, mm. right, and it's about that enjoyment of time, and then, and really kind of a very similar way, bespoke tailoring slows down that process of buying. Oh, buying. You can't just walk in and buy something and walk out. No, you, know? you have to really commit yourself to the process and the time. Yeah, and it's a it's a time it's a time process. It's mm-hmm. a very it's one a labor of, on our side, and it's a labor on. I mean, there's a bit of a labor on the client side as well of showing up and being involved and being, yeah. you know, a part of it. Um, but that's what I always tell clients when I'm talking to them about cloth. And, you know, I'm always kind of consulting them on getting cloth that's going to be able to st- stand the test of time. Because we put 80 hours of work into it. You've invested time and money into it as well. So you always want to find a piece that's going to last you. Yeah. For a long longevity. Yeah. For its longevity. Or else it's not worth it for you. It's yeah. not worth it for yeah. me. Yeah. Well, I mean, there is the... Um, old adage of cost per wear, which mm-hmm. is a, a mind game that I feel like we play with ourselves to justify spending a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it, it can, you know, but it does, there is a grain of truth to it whenever it comes to bespoke uh, tailoring because there's a longevity to the garment. There should be. There should be. Right. Yeah. If it's made properly, yeah. and that means, you know, as we've learned, I know we had a very similar journey of not having things made too tight. Yes. Allowing appropriate amount of room. Yes. Cutting things for braces with kind of a generous waist helps mm-hmm. that. Uh, and making sure you get some drape, you know, through the jacket that, exactly. you know, as your chest kind of fills out a little bit, which it does for all of us. Yeah. Um, or even through movement. I mean, through movement, through sitting, like uh, my test with clients has always been when you sit, can you, can you button your coat when you sit? I don't know. Can you? Um, well, shoot. You now made it. I did. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little tight when you button though, right? No, it's all right. It doesn't feel too tight. I'm not seeing it upright. Yeah, it's okay. Hmm. No. That's what I've always done. Because I've always wanted... This garment was a few pounds ago. Because <laughs> it was when you were pre-40, pre right? Yeah, pre-40. Um, That's right. But yeah, I've always said... The clock is ticking on me. <laughs> I've always said, like, if you can sit in your coat while it's buttoned and feel comfortable, <clears throat> then then th- that that's a comfortable, that's a well-cut coat. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times men's first reaction is to unbutton their coat. But to me... I I want to stay, I want to stay as pretty as I was when I was standing when I'm sitting. You know, I always try at least. It's hard work. <laughs> but yeah, I've always I've always had clients who go, you know, can you take this in? Can you take this in? And I'm like, no, no, yeah, you don't want to. And that's the role of a tailor to be like, look, you don't. Yeah. You may think you want this painted on you. Yeah. <laughs> but you don't. But you don't. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a lot of times I get that with new clients with the drape in the chest the first time they get it. And there's, they're always like, well, there's all this cloth here. I'm like, yeah, but look how beautiful you look when, you know, you have shape, you have a chest, you have a waist, you have hips, you know. Yeah. Like, you don't have, like, you don't have that when you don't, when you take your coat off. Yeah. You know, like, I'm giving you that because you don't yeah. have it. So you have mm-hmm. to add fullness. You have to mm-hmm. have 
artifice. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. a different different mentality, I yeah. think. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what uh, what else do you think they're going to be roasting us for in the comments on that last piece? <laughs> What's your guess, Eric? I definitely think they'll say something about the way you say Sartoria <laughs> because they can't not. Yeah. <laughs> and um, like, how much crap are we going to get barely this speak, one? I barely speak English, <laughs> yeah. much less French or Italian. <laughs> uh, so, um, no, I, I mean, I think, I think for the most part, people's criticisms are, are good. I yeah. think they, they always help me try to do better. I mean, the other thing is like people, I don't think people understand, but most artisans, most craftsmen are their own worst critic. Like most people who are criticizing a garment are not saying anything that the tailor is not already thinking of, yeah. or caught or thought of yeah. or wished he did better or mm -hmm. tried to do better or anything along yeah. those lines. Like you're, you're not catching, you're not catching things I'm not seeing. You know what I mean? Um, but there's there's a there's a big process in in finding out how you can yeah. do the best possible thing that you can do with what you've got and what you've mm -hmm. what you've started, you know. And so like even in this last fitting, like we saw these two minor details yeah. that were things that we wanted to fix, and it was mm -hmm. seen by both of us. And it's something that plagues me, and it's like it's always something that I want to do better. Yeah. And, you know, I've always there was a tailor one time who always said who said that tailoring is suffering, and it's pain. And I, I always kind of agreed with that wholeheartedly is because you're not only suffering and, and it's painful and the making <laughs> and the time consuming that you're doing, yeah. but also in how much that one garment racks your brain and how much you think about it even after you've delivered it. And, you know, yeah. you know, there's always, I, I met with Edward Sexton when I was, a, I was going to apprentice with Edward Sexton after apprenticing with Gallo. And it fell through because one, it's impossible to live in England when you're dirt, or Not in London money. when you're dirt poor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I was talking to him and, and he said, um, he said, the one thing that I've always found in tailoring is if you ever think that you've done anything perfect, you should quit because you've, you, you've given up on your trade. And I always thought that was very intelligent. And even now, further on down the line, yeah. I think the same thing. There's the never a time where I think, like, that garment was perfect. Yeah. Because you're always, as a tailor, as a craftsman, you're always thinking, I could do that better. What yeah. could I do better? How could yeah. I do that better? Mm -hmm. Client is happy as a clamp, yeah. you know. But to me, it's always that suffering of how you can figure yeah. out how to do something better. Yeah, I guess that's the true nature of an artisan or a craftsperson yeah. is that, continuous kind of pursuit of perfection but realizing that you'll never get there yeah exactly right? yeah and i think being this, okay with that yeah i think it's the same thing that happens with the you and and what you put out on youtube and, yeah. and the and the process that you go through with that I'm, i mean i'm sure when you first started the things that you were putting out you're like now like oh my gosh what were you doing <laughs> but even you know but even like probably uh six months ago you're probably like we could have done that better yeah. we could have done that better yeah. I think that's the, yeah, like you said, that's a sign of someone who's yeah. passionate about what they do and yeah. craftsman. Yeah. So what do you think the, um, you know, top five greatest misperceptions are of a bespoke tailor? You know, let's, let's talk through these a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> I, I've sat down with clients of mine who have more of my, of my clothes in their wardrobe than I have in mine. <laughs> and, and they'll even say like, oh, like Eric, like you, you have that type of suit, don't you? And I'd go, I got three. Yeah. Like I got three suits. Three man. suits, yeah. And I got one odd jacket and one odd trouser. That's it. Yeah. And they'd be like, Really? And I'm like, Yeah, like what do you what do you think I do all day? Yeah. Like you think I just like send stuff, oh hey tailors, you know, yeah, you make don't this have for me. you don't have a thousand other things to do. Make I'll cut this and you make it for me. You know, and then and then people are calling me like, Where's my suit? So I'm like, Well, I'm making me one. So <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's a misconception. It's kinda yeah. like that thing about the the cobbler's shoe, yeah. or you can always tell the kids, uh, the kid of a cobbler, yeah, because he always has the worst shoes. The worst shoes. Yeah. Um, what's the other misconception of tailors? Well, I think well, one I would say is is what a lot of the made to measureists have put in people's heads, which is so like a made to measureist takes orders, takes measurements, sends it out somewhere, comes back finished, puts it on the client, sends them out the door, right? So what else is that guy doing all day? Yeah. Nothing but content. So he's sitting around smoking cigars, drinking Negronis. Yeah. You know, so if, I, if, a, if a tailor's got too many photographs of him on Instagram, you should worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, unless he's like working. Like he's, yeah. he's hunched over a, a, a desk. Fine. Yeah. But if he's out there like what yeah. we're doing right now. Jumping on fire hydrants. Yeah. It's like, you know. <laughs> exactly. Might worry. So I feel like a lot of. Uh, he might not be a bespoke tailor. Yeah, exactly. 
I think a lot of misconception of bespoke tailoring is that, you know, we have this all this free time to do these luxurious things, mm -hmm. which we don't. Mm. Sorry, I had to enjoy this before it went out. I, I would say another thing, and I think this has a lot to do with the youth, mm. Yeah, uh, and even people who pretend to be tailors, is that it's easy to get into. And once you start within a year of schooling or anything like that, you'll be like, able to make coats yeah. and fittings just around the corner. Like I don't think people understand the long time that it takes to learn this craft. And I think the other reason why they don't understand that is because they don't understand what goes into it. Um, yeah. Because it's, it's a terrifying amount of work. Yeah. Like, I don't, I say like, oh, our suits take 80 hours to make and most people go, oh, wow, that's a lot of time. Like if you actually think 80 hours to make like this, only yeah. this, that's, that's, that, that should be mind blowing to people. Yeah. And then all the foundation of what goes into yeah. getting to the point where you could get to And there's hours. so much opportunity to do it poorly. Poorly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so So it's 80 many. hours, but it's like you can... <laughs> do a terrible job cutting the pattern. Yes. You can do a terrible job pattern matching. Yes. You can do a terrible job with your buttonholes. Yeah. You can do a terrible job with, you know, Every, yeah, everything. And everything, like the, making the canvas. So the canvas is your foundation. So you could pour your foundation terribly, and then the rest of the coat's messed up. Like everything, every step along the way is you have the opportunity to destroy that suit. Mm -hmm. Just like in every yeah. step. Even down to, like you said, like the buttonhole. You yeah. cut a buttonhole, and you put it together, and you sew it terribly yeah that's ruin, that's ruin, a nice ruin suit. the, you suit. Ruin the yeah. whole suit yeah. and it's a stupid buttonhole yeah <laughs> takes 30 minutes to ruin yeah. a suit 30 minutes to yeah <laughs> and you've got 80 hours of mm -hmm. those opportunities you've got 160 opportunities you know to, to, at least to ruin the suit. to ruin the suit yeah so there's a there's a lot of this misconception about that and i think that has to do a lot with why or with the fact that like nowadays we have a very is it this way this no, way no, no. other hand you got it Help me. There's a way to do this, and yeah, I know there's really have cool. It, have it look graceful. Yeah. You know. Can you swear on this? Uh, <laughs> we swear on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me. Ask you know the gods at YouTube. Yeah, that's true, huh? That's another word we probably shouldn't say, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> God <laughs> or YouTube. I totally forgot to give you a hard time for the two buttons on the cuff also. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, someone else, you know, Fabio. Yeah. He he thought this was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, oh, wow, you, you guys do two buttons on your cuffs? And I said, well, if you're walking around New York and you see anybody else with two buttons on their cuffs, we made this. Most suit. likely we made yeah, that suit. Because yeah, because I don't want to do any more buttons on yeah. the cuffs. Yeah, that's two. right. And so he's like, oh, this so is part of the, uh, you know, <laughs> like the Italian heritage of like, not at the end of the day, really wanting to work too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, oh, and then giving a narrative. It's like, we're not going to do structures in the shoulders. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and let's the do no reason. buttons. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so, no, kidding. yeah. So that too, I, I actually like it now. I've come to come to enjoy it. I think for a casual suit like that, it works. Oh, yeah. You know, you wouldn't do it on like, you know, formal I suit would. like this, two buttons. I would. You, you would. Well, you're an <laughs> Italian tailor. You know, so you're allowed to, you're allowed them, to be yeah. far out. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I gotta put a like an O at the end of my last name, like Genziano or something. Genziano. Like that. Yeah. <laughs> and then then I could get away with then it. Then you could get away yeah. with it. Yeah. They'll just think like I'm very northern Italian, mm -hmm. like you know, right on the Austrian border or something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't I don't know if there's any other misconceptions how about that bespoke tailors are rich and that's another oh yeah like that's massive another misconception yeah. there's a there's like you know. a there's a handful of them that probably yeah. are yeah but, but other than that but you know the ones that i think really do well are the ones that you know built large kind of structures and enterprises where you know they've got three locations you know you know naples milan and london yeah yeah or, yeah um or just have you know have existed you know for for a hundred years, years you yeah. know and have a massive client base. But, you know, I mean, I guess, you know, more to that point, it's really, you know, even though the tailoring is expensive, I mean, you're at what, $5,500? Yeah, garment now, yeah. Which is expensive for yeah, a suit. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that's yeah. a lot of money. But when you take it into context of the cost of the cloth, you know, which in some cases could be, you know, five, six, eight hundred dollars Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. And then, you know, the time to 80 hours to sew the garment together yeah. or the fact that you travel, you know, mm -hmm. airfare, hotels, everything else, 
yeah. you know, to go visit your clients. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into the garment. I think I think Simon Crompton actually did an article on this a long time back of like actually looking at the margins. Uh, and the margins of bespoke tailoring isn't what many would perceive. And the margin of high fashion, on the other hand, that's made in the factory is massive. You know, it's massive. Yeah, but it's they're, they're paying nothing to get that thing made, like near nothing to get it made because it's it's mm-hmm. made like nothing. It has no soul. It has yeah. no body. It has no essence. Yeah. You know, it's like you know how much thought and 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 architecture or engineering went into just these shoulders. You know, like the, they're great shoulders. Yeah, I think. But you know, very what Italian. I'm, very, <laughs> but the thing is, is like to get to think about. Okay, how am I going to get these to sit up? How am I going to get them to not fall? And how, am I, how can I extend them off my shoulder, yeah. you know, an inch, and still get them to sit up and not put a shoulder pad in there? Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of engineering and thought process going in. Yeah. If you go, if you, how many times did you recut those shoulders? This is a combination of methodology that I learned from a little from me, a little from Chris, and a little from Antonio, who was the master t- coat maker for Gallo when I trained under Gallo. Okay. And so all those methodologies I kind of put into, I rolled them into one and kind of figured out like what I could do with it and then stamped my own stamp on it. Um, so it's a there's a there's a history of probably 100 years behind figuring yeah. out how to do this. Could you make that for a customer? Oh, yeah. If, if I could get people to Agree understand to it and enjoy it, <laughs> And maybe not to this degree, but to a, you know, to a little bit. I think it's a fantastic yeah. kind of house style. Why didn't you work in any um, any pleats, any small? In the spala camicha? Yeah. Because I wanted it to be clean. Okay. I, I the way I figured is if you do the spala camicha with an added an extended shoulder and you put the pleats in it, you're gonna look totally ridiculous. Yeah, crazier than I do right now. I don't think I look crazy. I think it looks fantastic. But what most We're people just would perceive? Yeah, I, know. I think it's a beautiful suit. <laughs> I appreciate you. It's great cloth. I think so too. <laughs> I think it's fantastic cloth. Um, but yeah, I think uh, if you did all that, you'd just kind of be avant-garde and yeah. it'd be overwhelming. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a degree. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, Chudelbar and Morgan. Oh, know, yeah. They did the, uh, what is With it? the pagoda the shoulder. Pagoda, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pagoda. Yeah. I mean, it could almost, yeah. you know. <laughs> go I mean, that that's way. like super structured. Oh, yeah. But then, you know how much engineering goes into getting a pagoda shoulder? Like, the way in which they have to cut the shoulder pad and the way they put the, then they have to put the shoulder pad together in a way that can create that roll. Yeah. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're cutting a wedge out of the center of the shoulder pad. Mm-hmm. And then you're putting the shoulder pad back together by hand stitching, pad stitching it. Yeah. Into that curve and getting that curve that goes yeah. out. And then you have to treat the canvas in the same way. So you have to create a wedge in the canvas in order to put that together. And then those have to marry together in order for the canvas and the shoulder pad to create that. Mm-hmm. It's, in, it's insane. All that yeah. for a shoulder pad. Like for yeah. a shoulder. Yeah. You know? Like... Who does that? Pe- people yeah. like us. Like yeah. crazy people. Crazy people. Yeah. Who that get into it for the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the money. <laughs> you th- I think when you start, you think, because you think like, this is how I thought when I started this, under my own name. I was like, all right, well, if I charge, <clears throat> back then I was charging like 4800 for a suit. Okay. I was like, I charge 4800 I um, buy the cloth for like seven 800 So it's four, 4K left, right? And then if I make the whole thing, Right? That's 4K profit. Yeah. Yeah. But then you're like, okay, well, that's one suit. But one suit with a 4K profit is not going to keep the lights on. Yeah. So you got to sell more. So then you sell more, and then you're like, how am I going to keep up with this? And then you get to the point where you realize I need help, and then you got to hire people, and then you hire people who actually can do the work, which yeah. are hard to find. Yeah. And it's just everything yeah. snowballs. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. snowballs. Yeah. It's not. I mean, what did you figure? Whenever you're doing all the work yourself, I think we had this conversation. What was the most number of suits Theoretically, you could make in a year. I mean, at that time, I probably could have done with having to do business. <clears throat> yeah, with having to visit the clients. Yeah, you have to do, do the, the business. You have to do the visit the clients. Yeah. You have to do the fittings. You have yeah, you've to. You got to take the subway to work. Take in the, the subway to work in the morning. You have to, you know, yeah, still do go have lunch, pocket yeah. day, have lunch, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I'd say three, three a month, maybe two, yeah, two to three lucky. a month if I was lucky. Yeah. yeah, if I was like really like. Sat down. Yeah, but that was like you know, miserable with life. Oh yeah. yeah, I mean that was like, like working, working all, all the time. The time. Yeah, because yeah. you don't understand. There's so many other things that yeah. happen throughout the day that take away from those hours that you yeah. have. I find that too. Sometimes I'm if I just do one thing a day, I'm like, oh, well, I guess it was a productive day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I've kind of got. I was here all day. Yeah. I did one. Thing. I got one thing yeah. done. Yeah. I know. 
I've one, done that. One thing on my list. Yeah, I've done that where it's like I've sh- I've I shaped a coat. So when I talk about shaping a coat, it's like after the final fitting or after the the final basted fitting, when you're gonna when I'm gonna send it off to Italy. So you make like all the final adjustments. You take the final measurements and everything. You write them all down. Well, if I do one of those a day, I'm usually like, that was a good day. It's a good day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that's it. Yeah. Like, that's all you did. Yeah. I kind of want to talk about yeah. it. Where all are you traveling to now? Uh, so we're here in Dallas, then down in Houston, then LA, and oddly enough, San Diego. Okay. And I don't know how we got clients in San Diego because I used to live in San Diego and nobody wore suits, but. Yeah. You found them. I found them. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. And are you doing suits for these people? Yeah, yeah. Odd suits, jackets, and trousers. Uh, odd jackets, trousers, shirts. Which, by the way, I forgot your shirt. Hmm. Yeah, we were going to do a shirt. It's made. It's I made, made it. Yeah. Ah. I mean, the, the same. Well, we'll made debut it. the shirt with the final piece. Yeah, there we go. I'll send it down to you and then you can we'll figure it out. I can take it straight out of the box and wear it. Just make sure, like, you go yeah. first. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw it in my bag for a little bit. <laughs> you know. yeah. Right around with it in yeah. the back. Well, great. I mean, you know, it's incredible to see kind of how far. I mean, I mean, you're really, I think at this point, kind of living the dream. You know, in some ways, I mean, you've developed an incredible business out of New York. Yeah, you're doing uh, Italian you. tailoring at the highest level. Uh, you're actually able to get garments out. Right? Yeah, which which means is that you're not bottlenecking yourself. Yes, right. You've got Storia Gallo in Rome. Yeah, you know, doing the construction. Yeah, yeah. Which also helps deliver a more consistent product at a higher level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, I mean, as far as you know, the spoke tailoring here in the United States, I mean. You know, it's literally less than a handful of people doing it. Yeah. You know, at this point, and I think that that's pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's a, it's kind of exciting to be a part of the that small group, that small niche. Um, and they're all young, which is really exciting. It's really quite cool. I mean, yeah, you've got Ralph cutting for Huntsman, Huntsman. who's quite young. You got Joe, who's around my age, quite young as well. Um, Tiffin Brow in mm-hmm. New York as well. He's quite young. Um, who else is in New York? That's I mean, you got Paolo. Paolo. You know, well. You know, who's, you know, he's not a bespoke tailor himself, but I mean, the product that he's put together is on that level. Yeah. Um, and then he got, I mean, Frank's old now up in upstate New York, Frank Shattuck. Um, and then Len Logsdale, he's getting up there. But that's, yeah. I mean, I would say that's that's the handful right there that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But. Well, you know, there's just, you know, a few kind of other small guys, right? Maybe. Mm. I, mean, I don't even know them all, right? I would imagine. But, I mean, I'm sure there's someone I'm missing. But what's interesting, though, is that, you know, you have that, you know, true kind of provenance of made in Italy. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, Where like. You know that everything that you have from Satoria Gallo is made by you in New York, yeah. right? Or And finished in Rome. Yeah. And Huntsman, much in the same way. You've got Ralph Cutting it's yeah. made on Savile Row. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and they, yeah, we uh, basically there's a degree of provenance to that. Exactly, and I, I would say, yeah, Huntsman and, and us have pretty, basically the same well, mirrored type of, of business, you know. In in that Huntsman has a main flagship store uh, in England, in London, and then they have their other store in New York with a head cutter and tailor there, yeah, with like a staff cutter. Yeah, and then you've got same thing with Gallo. We have a main flagship store in Rome, yeah. and then we have an offshoot here in New, or there in New York with yeah. a cutter. Yeah. So it's Great. actually, it's quite cool to see that kind of juxtaposition. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would say Huntsman is one of the, you could get your most true Savile most true Row bespoke. bespoke suit, yeah. right, in the U.S. Like, they're yeah. the only guys who have, like, a permanent U.S. presence, US presence Savile, yeah. Savile Row. Yeah. And I would say we are the only ones who have a true Italian presence in New York, where you can yeah. get a true Italian suit. No, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Eric, always a pleasure to have you here. I appreciate it. You know, we're off to dinner. I've not allowed you to smoke any of your cigar. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very rude host, you know. <laughs> it's all right. So it was we'll fun. allow you to finish this. Um, yeah, off camera. But a beautiful, beautiful jacket. I appreciate Can't wait it. to wear that. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Looking at it over your shoulder. <laughs> longingly. And, uh, longingly. <laughs> waiting for it to be finished and yeah. buttonholes to be put in. Yeah. We'll uh, get it out uh, to you soon. And, uh, you know, to be able to wear that and enjoy it, you know, in good health. Definitely. So. Eric. Thank you, Kirby. Appreciate yeah. you having me by. Pleasure is always mine. Yeah, and yeah. congratulations on your success as well. Well, six hundred thousand subscribers. No, nothing you know. to laugh at. And it's uh, you know, I never thought I would, I would be there. And it's incredible. You know, I remember when you were smoking like in my office with the an incredible air filtration system. Exactly. This is the dream. Exactly. You're living the dream. Soon in my soon in my house. <laughs> I saw that. That's incredible. Uh, we're gonna have to come over. 
<laughs> well, you and Rachel will be amongst the, our first dinner guests. That sounds wonderful. It'll probably be a year before we have furniture. Yeah, you know, well. type thing. But <laughs> whatever. We'll do our best. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Eric, right. thank you. Cheers, man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>